Hello, everybody, and welcome to this conversation on the philosophical underpinnings of qualitative work, focusing a little bit on constructivist grounded theory as well. I'm just going to pull up my screen really quick or share my screen so that we can follow along with the notes and PowerPoint presentation for this week. Get situated. Okay. All right. So the title of this week's presentation is Philosophical Assumptions and Interpretive Frameworks. And so we're going to be focusing heavily on our reading from Quest, Presswell and Sharmaz for this week. So I'd like to start out with a really inspirational quote um, from Cresswell's reading, which is, we are not advocating for the acceptance of qualitative inquiry in a quantitative world. Qualitative research is a legitimate mode of social and human science exploration without apology or comparisons to quantitative research. And I would just like to start there and really frame our course with that um, concept in the sense that we have long fought for legitimacy as a field. Um, I would like to think that has improved particularly in recent times um, with the imperative a need to focus on the life world perspectives, experiences, meaning attached to human um, interaction and meaning making. So I just want to start there for the semester, as well as focus on the five approaches to qualitative inquiry that are outlined in Cresswell's book. So I focused on this a little bit last week in class, but um, the way that these two books really fit together is that you know, these five approaches to qualitative research, narrative, phenomenology, Greta theory, and ethnography are approaches in their own right. Yet we need coding strategies to be able to tackle our data and be able to plug in to all of these approaches, which why are we, we are using Sharmaz's book, which not only gives us um, you know, a special look into interpretive frameworks, constructivist worldview, but also teaches us very hands-on coding strategies to be able to plug into each of these five approaches. Um, Presswell's reading for the week um, talks a lot about why we do research and how our choice of approach influences our research. I would just like to start the semester out by saying do not cite in your future papers or in your assignments for this week Cresswell as um, a main source. So one of the interest when citing each of these approaches, because one of the interesting things that Cresswell makes very um, upfront in his reading is that he is really summarizing the work of others. So it's really a secondary citation his book is, whereas he lays out the main thought leaders that he is citing when discussing narrative phenomenology, ethnography, and case studies. So he takes a deep dive into what philosophical assumptions and beliefs we bring into our research. And he makes the claim that we need to be aware of these assumptions and we need to make a choice about whether or not we wanna actively incorporate them into our studies. So he believes that philosophical assumptions inform the choice of theories that underpin our research. So he talks a lot about epistemology and the importance of epistemology. Um, particularly juxtaposing the idea of constructivism and interpretivism, which is the worldview of qualitative research, to positivism, which really is the dominant worldview of social science and scientific inquiry in general. So let's go through the two lists and see how they are similar and different. Um, so for constructivism and interpretivism, um, we start by saying human beings try to make sense of the situation they are in. Therefore, social phenomena are a result of human interpretation. 
people create certain social phenomena and this cannot be measured. So that is why we re reject the idea of scales and survey-based research. Um, we need to instead explore meaning and context um, in order to be able to describe things qualitatively. And we believe that meaning is formed through interactions with others and historical and cultural norms. In comparison, positive, positivism, and particularly post-positivism, um, believes that um, everything that exists is based on certain laws, so laws of nature. These things are based on facts and therefore are not fixed. And we need to understand the truth by researching using qualitative, quantitative methods. We're comparing one fact with the other and comparing them, um, then calculating well there is whether there is a significant difference. So we look at cause and effect. We collect data in a very ordered and systematic way. And I just wanna make a note about positivism, which is now really referenced as post-positivism being a dominant paradigm, um, is that it, it requires us to collect data using methods um, and analysis um, with steps. So this is really the way that journal articles are written. Um, qualitative methods can also be done using a post-positivist worldview and approach, but in that case, qualitative data often pay, plays the supporting role. So for example, this research is really led by quantitative data and the qualitative results really fit into the quantitative findings. Um, so what we're talking about in this class is not that, or not, you know, really not focusing on how qualitative methods can best support quantitative research, but like Cresswell says that qualitative methods are a legitimate form of inquiry in their own right. Okay. However, I want to encourage you, and I say this to my students every year, when it comes to embarking on your research, project dissertation, if you can answer your questions quantitatively, by all means, answer them quantitatively. It's quicker, more efficient, less expensive, probably less painstaking. However, for those who, of us who pursue qualitative projects, we consider this to be transformational research. So for those of us who are interested in dealing with complex issues such as race, gender, power, and class, and how that influences experiences, worldviews, and meanings, um, those of us who are interested in critical race theory, critical theory, feminism, queer theory, disability theories, um, particularly laid out in Cresswell's reading. Um, we believe in empowerment through illuminating constraints that are experienced by human beings and consider this to be a transformational research approach. Um, international researchers are very, very concerned with uh, taking more of a critical transformational approach to researchers outside the United States. For example, um, this weekend I took 12 students to the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry from the University of Louisville, and you could see that there's high, high levels of representation on um, and any conference that is rooted in qualitative inquiry. So getting back to what are the philosophical underpinnings outlined by Cresswell, um, it's important to really look sort of at a top-down approach, being ontology being the broadest, methodology being the most narrow. So ontology focuses on the nature of reality. Epistemology is really the theory of knowledge production. So what counts as knowledge and how knowledge claims are justified. Axiology are the roles of value in research. And so as qualitative researchers, we ask ourselves whether or not research can be truly free of value. In qualitative work, our answer to that question is no. There is no value-free, neutral-based research because we ourselves, um, the researcher, collects data. We are a part of the data collection instrument. And methodology is really the recipe or the process of doing research. And all of this leads us to collecting data or trying to understand what is truth with a capital T. So how does this play out in, um, see, in qualitative research? 
so our ontological worldview means that we are embracing multiple realities with the intent on reporting on these multiple realities. Um, we like to demonstrate a range of positions within our data reporting. So regression towards the mean is not the outcome or goal. In terms of epistemology, we believe that the best style of research comes from getting as close to our participants as possible. So our evidence is based on individual views, and this is how knowledge is known. In terms of axiology or the values, we believe that researchers should make their values known. So what am I bringing into the field with me? So for me personally, I'm bringing my race, my gender, my social class, my PhD, my professional background, and all of my experiences with me to the field to approach my research problem or topic. And that should be known to the audience that's consuming my research. Methodology, our methodology is inductive, emergent, shaped by the researchers' experiences in the field, and research questions can change. So we're also interested in seeking out the negative cases. So for example, this comes later in theoretical sampling with constructivist grounded theory. So we're constantly searching for findings that act as a counterpoint to the main findings that we are searching for within the field, because we're very interested in embracing multiple realities based on our ontological assumptions. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead here. Okay, so let's go back to a little bit of our histories and our traditions. So what has influenced our constructivist worldview? So in constructivist grounded theory, we really have this old school and new school worldview. So I'm going to first introduce William James, who is from Harvard, who's really considered the grandfather of American pragmatism. Then um, we really introduce the next three gentlemen who are all trained from the University of Chicago, the Chicago School of Sociology, also known as the Chicago School of Thought. So John Dewey is the next gentleman. Um, and John Dewey, for those of you who have a background in education or educational psychology, revolutionized schools with a lot of the ideas that he borrowed or was influenced by from William James. He believed that in educational systems, we need to engage children, youth, any sort of people who are being educated in problem solving. So he believed that education is messy, dirty. We need to offer ourselves as human beings projects with no easily, easy solutions. So his work at the time really in, in, impacted civil rights and political activism. And he was also heavily influence, influencing at the time someone named Ger, George Herbert Mead. So George Herbert Mead was an amazing scholar, but he did not write much down. So in his lectures at the University of Chicago in the sociology department, he talked a lot about an idea that he coined symbolic interactionism. However, he passed away and he influenced um, Herbert Bloomer, who's the last gentleman to the right. And Bloomer was a key student of Mead, and he wrote up symbolic interactionism to explain what Mead was talking about. So when we reference or cite symbolic interactionism, we are always citing um, Herbert Bloomer's book. However, there's a long line of tradition of people that have sort of developed and influenced pragmatism, and social and symbolic interactionism. So this all took place or was really developed in the University of Chicago in the 1920s and 30s. So this was the first ecological school that was focused on urban sociology and field research. And so researchers that were trained there at the time were focusing on learning ethnography, um, they were studying homelessness, poverty, and what was known as juvenile delinquency at the time. And um, that was really the first um, account that we have of people really developing and honing in on qualitative data analysis skills. This gave way to the new school so of thought. So the person on the left-hand side, the gentleman above, is Barney Glazer. And the right of him is Ansem Strauss. And together, these two gentlemen studied 
at the Chicago School of Sociology and were trained under this method. And from that developed um, a book called The Discovery of Grounded Theory. So the discovery of grounded theory focused mainly on the methods that they were learning in um, the field that, from the University of Chicago, but they wanted to further develop them, thinking that this would be a systematic way of generating theory from the ground up, meaning that we were not using any a priori theories, but we were generating new theories that were data-driven, that were observational, that came from interview data. So these men branched out eventually into two different directions. So Barney Glazer traveled to Columbia and he really stayed true in many ways to his quantitative background. He was interested in developing middle range theory development and precise coding. And funny, probably one of the most famous people that he has influenced is Brene Brown, who he was actually um, one of the members of her dissertation committee and her form of qualitative research is really a form of Lasserian grounded theory. I have been more influenced um, by Ansem Strauss, probably because I was trained in the West Coast where Ansem Strauss ended up going. Um, and really after the Chicago School of Sociology, he went out and trained folks at UCSF, including the three women below who are named Julia Corbin, Kathy Charmaz and Adele Clark. So they really developed their skills under um, the instruction of Anson Strauss, but then took things in a new direction, which emphasized multiple perspectives, freewheeling data analysis, creativity, far out comparisons, heavily influenced by pragmatism and symbolic interactionism. These three women came to prominence in the 1990s when we're very influenced by postmodernism, which was based on changing ways of thinking based on critiques and critical thinking, showing the negative conditions, often the negative cases, examining silences that exist in the data, and really used a lot of the processes of deconstruction um, to bring to the surface um, the fixed hierarchy, our hierarchies, which existed in the data and people's social world. So again, we're gonna go back a little bit to talk and review pragmatism and symbolic interactionism because they're so key to the underpinnings of what we're gonna cover all semester. So pragmatism again was developed at the University of Chicago. So pragmatism is a focus on action. It's not committed to one philosophy or reality. Um, the main tenet of, in my opinion, about pragmatism is that we do research to solve problems. So the key issues of pragmatism is thinking is the same as doing. You can't think without doing and vice versa. It also believes that human beings are engaged in their world and it's often anti-intellectual. So turned off by philosophers with lofty ideas and more engaged with ideas that generate action. Pragmatism posits that human beings do stuff every day for one simple reason, and that reason is because it works. So as human beings, we always do what works. It is heavily drawn from Darwin's theory of natural selection, that as human beings, we're always adapting and changing and repeating behavior that is working for us. Um, this kind of worldview actually helps us to avoid judging behavior of our research participants. And I think it actually fits well for those of us who study, you know, stigmatize or populations that experience stigma and marginalization. Because if someone you're interviewing um, and you, you, you is saying something that you're perplexed by um, or what they did, it forces you to get over it and ask questions such as, how did that work for you? let me understand how you see your world. Because that action, whatever that action may be, had meaning in their world. So getting back to John Dewey, he took these steps further and he came up with ideas that schools should be more egalitarian, dirty and messy, giving students scenarios and let them figure them out. He was very political. He had a focus on human rights and civil rights, which really revolutionized schools. Um, he believed that adaptation happens through problem solving, 
problem solving and how this maps onto doing research is that we should understand what makes sense in our research participants context and we should try to understand what is the main task of humans and according to him the main task of humans is problem solving that is what really separates us from the rest of the world and the species in the animal kingdom so george herbert mead again was a key student of dewey he did not write much down he was teacher of herbert bloomer and Bloomer came up to the concept of symbolic interactionism, which I often refer to as SI to describe what Mean was talking about. So, sorry, to describe what Mead was talking about. What is symbolic interactionism according to Herbert Bloomer? It, we, as human beings, we have thoughts about selves. We have thoughts about subject-object dynamic and our relationship to other things. So relationship to our loved ones, relationship to groups, relationships to institutions. We believe that meaning comes from social interaction between two people or between two groups. We also have this interesting idea called mind action, which is an ongoing dialogue inside of all of our heads. And this is where meaning is generated. And mind action focuses on thoughts about self and the subject object dynamic. And this sounds kind of complex, but the way I describe to this um, often to my students is that you really understand mind action when you're teaching or lecturing a group of students, which all of you will very soon, or maybe you already have, is that there's this constant inner voice inside your head where you are in real time interpreting whether or not your students are understanding your material, whether or not you're a good teacher based on their reactions, whether or not what you're doing is going well. So the appraisal of the self and the appraisal of action often comes through interactions with others and is generated through mind action. So mind action and interaction is really symbolic interactionism's focus on action. So Bloomer took this a step further, and this is where we integrate pragmatism, is that human beings are also actors and doers. And this takes things beyond opinion and perception. So oftentimes as qualitative researchers were asked, well, how is your work different than just like really good journalism? And that is what, what really separates us in many ways is that not only are we doing research in a really systematic way, is that we are taking things beyond opinion and perception to look at how meaning influences participants' actions. And we look at interactions between one person and interactions with many and how they form one's meaning and relationship with the world. We also focus on interactions or reactions from a larger group. And that's what really stays with us because people tell you what they want you to think about them. And that comes true in research settings and interview settings as well. So we have to focus on actions in order to be able to get deeper into our research questions and aims. There's also focus on symbols. So we should probably understand what a symbol is and tease that out in class. So symbols have meaning. They can be absolutely anything. For example, a table can be something that we eat off of, something that we use to study on, but it can also be something else like a bed. And we can redefine that again and again and again. So a really great um, book to read or piece is The Gift, and um, that by Marcel Mauss. So one of the interesting things about The Gift is that it takes a deep dive into what does the gift symbolize. It's not really about gift giving or the physical sense of the gift, but it's more about reciprocity and exchange. Um, and so we wanna think about something being a physical object like a gift, but also something becomes a symbol when it's also social. And when a social object has meaning, then it becomes a symbol. But getting back to pragmatism, this becomes important because human beings need to get stuff done. In symbolic interactionism, we're getting at meaning and how meaning is generated in the world. And we believe that there's an intentional aspect in a societal agreement that goes along with the way we use symbols. Another element of symbolic interactionism is posits that as human beings, we have this unique ability to take on the role of the other. 
We have this unique position to be able to do this. And this is the way we make meaning in our big, beautiful brains. So for example, we have the ability to position ourselves in being the shoe in the shoes of our research participants. So we can imagine what it's like to have experienced the things that they have experienced. And our jo job as researchers is to just understand, sit back and to understand and to take in their stories, their narratives, their meanings and their actions. And the way this comes into play is when we think about a, a research question or the way that we ask research questions in interview guides. So for example, something that would really not scratch the surface, really not even scratch the surface to being able to answer a qualitative research question that would get at symbolic interactionism and pragmatism and meaning and action would be, what do you think about birth control? Because that's a question that just gets at perception. So I want us to think about another way to ask this question while getting at symbolic interactionism and pragmatism. And something that addresses the usefulness of birth control is a way to get at this. So for example, when was the last time you used birth control? What caused you to use birth control? These are two questions that get at symbolic interactionism and pragmatism, what they did and why they did it. And this is why um, surveys often become an empty shell. An example I like to give about this is the idea of surveying somebody about experiences related to trauma. And often when you give somebody a survey, their self-rated appraisal of their own trauma is quite low. But if you were to have a qualitative interview where you were to explore the experience of, of trauma, as a researcher, you might actually start to understand wow, this is a person who has had traumatic experiences, but this, for whatever reason, the survey is not picking up on what their interpretation of the trauma is. And that's just one of many, many, many examples. So getting back to some of our assumptions about pragmatism, is that people tend to notice what is useful. Because in pragmatism, we assume that people are always adapting, always changing. So tell me about that, because it seems as though it was very useful to you. That is a great follow-up question when we are doing um, some, when we are doing qualitative interviewing, and somebody says something that might be puzzling or mysterious, or we want to know more about. Tell me more about that, because it seems very useful to you. Or what was useful to you about that experience? That helps us to go deeper and to be able to utilize our symbolic interactionism and our pragmatist worldview. Next, let's move on to Kathy Sharmaz. So I think this is a really great transition to her book. Kathy Sharmaz starts out her writing by talking that, uh, by explaining to the reader that it's not a recipe book, um, but it offers possible routes to take. And this is because she's very highly committed to a constructivist worldview. She says that there's a lot that goes into how she sees grounded theory or constructivist grounded theory, but in the end, this is just her construction. So she focuses on one key question, which is what is happening here? And she means what is happening here in the data that we are collecting? So ultimately, we will go back to this question. Um, Kathy Sharmaz starts out her book by talking about the differences between more traditional grounded theory. So she's referencing the book, um, The Discovery of Grounded Theory by Barney Glazer and Ansem Strauss. And then she's juxtaposing that with her idea or her new idea of constructivist grounded theory. So just let's quickly review the tenets of grounded theory. So grounded theory means that we are simultaneously involved in data collection and analysis. We're constructing analytic codes and categories from data, not preconceived ideas about data that we're mapping on to existing data. We're using a constant comparison method, meaning that we are constantly comparing data point with data point, participant A with participant B, um, segment of data with other segments of data. And all of this helps us to advance theory. So this is how we develop theory during each stage of the data collection and analysis. 
They believe in memo writing to elaborate categories with specific properties that define relationships and identify gaps. Sampling is actually aimed at theory construction, which is why we introduced the idea of theoretical sampling. And last but not least, which I think really differs from how we do research now, is that they believe in conducting a literature review after. They believe in the utility of entering the field tabla rasa, um, uninfluenced by the literature so that you're able to truly not be influenced ahead of time. And that is not exactly the same as the kind of um, approach we're going to be taking in class. However, a lot of the tenants are same or heavily influencing what we're So I'm going to talk about some of the additions to traditionalist grounded theory that really influence constructivist grounded theory. So constructivist grounded theory highlights the flexibility of the methods and resists mechanical applications of it. It has a less authoritative voice when it comes to the researcher. So we're talking about possibilities that may exist in our data or in our participants' view. We start with the assumption that social reality is multiple. So that's like why we like to highlight multiple perspectives takes the researcher into account, which is why reflexivity is so important. Um, we use theoretical sensitizing concepts. So we are allowed to use existing theory, allowed to use existing literature to influence how we construct our research questions, our aims, our interview guides, etc. And lastly, it believes that research acts are not given, but they are constructed by human beings. So this fosters the researchers' rec reflexivity about their actions and decisions. We believe that there's no neutral observers, no value-free ex experts, and that's really a breakaway from the Chicago School. And this allows us to be co-constructors of knowledge and data in partnership with our research participants. So an analogy I like to think about this is it's a cup with a handle. So we are going to be out in the field collecting a ton of data, interviewing a lot of people for many, many hours. Um, and this is sort of an analogy of, for coding. So coding allows us to separate, sort, and synthesize qualitative data. And coding actually gives us a handle on our data, similar to how a handle on a coffee cup allows us to be able to drink the hot liquid, which I'm using as an analogy for our data. Um, and the handle allows us to do stuff with that cup. Ultimately, we are going to go back to the question of what is happening here, but we need to be able to have a way of being able to handle our data or our coffee in order for it to be useful for us to be able to drink it. And that's what coding does for us. So we're going to be using a lot of constructivist grounded theory analytic techniques and coding throughout the semester. So back to pragmatism and integrating symbolic interactionism, we really want to focus on process. So not structure. So sociology is very highly concerned with structure. Whereas in constructivism or constructivist grounded theory, we're really interested in social processes. So stages and phases, looking at humans who are constantly doing, looking at how change, stages change over time. We're really interested in developing process models. We believe that we are living in a movie, not a photograph. Words matter, actions matter, and how we see reality is all wrapped up in this stuff. So humans are active agents, not just passive in their environment. And that's not to undermine the idea that the environments that we live in cause tremendous constraints on human beings all of the time. It's just that we believe that human beings are actually always fighting and problem solving to be able to find a way through their world. And that's what we're really interested in examining those kinds of social processes. Through this idea of unfolding temporal sequences. So we're interested in what came before, what became after, and that's why our questions when we're constructing our interview guides and asking questions often look for benchmarks, milestones, turning points. So if you see this in your data, then great. 
we're looking for stage models, figures, concepts, and maybe even the beginning of a theory. So focusing on what our end game is, Strauss and Corbin really focused on developing theory and believe that what we are doing is building theory. Whereas Sharmaz is saying we're engaging in constructivist grounded theory. So what we are really doing is theorizing. So you can see the difference in the language there. And what we're doing is really raising it up. So we're focusing on describing things that are very concrete and moving them up to more abstract. So how this works is that we're looking and starting at empirical indicators, which are narrative data. And then we move to a grounded theory, which is grounded in those data. And then we might look at situation specific theories, then a little higher up middle range theories, and then eventually grand theories. And we do this by raising up each level of conceptualization to more abstraction. But what we're really interested in is this grounded theory area, which are theories that are grounded in narrative data, or empirical indicators. So constructivists would say, we are co-constructing meaning with our participants. Bob, let's say he's one of our participants, did not just give it away. You went out and found it. That's the co-construction piece. And our position changes based on what we are going to see. So our goal is to understand that position. So what is Bob's unique position in your data? What is he concerned about? And I just wanna mention that sometimes Bob's concerns in relationship to your research topic might be totally different than your concerns. And that's something that we need to handle. We need to learn about our research aims often shift in the field based on our interactions with our research participants and what their priorities are. So constructivists would say, what are our participants sensitizing concepts and what are our sensitizing concepts? These are things that we need to write down and memo. So I also wanna challenge you to think about what is the nursing schools or social work or public health or education's professions sensitizing concepts. So what are our you know, code of ethics? What theories, um, existing theories or principles influence our professional practice? And how am I bringing these with me into the field? So that is all that I have for this week in terms of our lecture. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, so with all of that information, the reading and um, the lecture, I'm going to post your reflection questions for this week. And so what I want you to do is to answer one of those reflection questions. And then I want you on our discussion board, which I'm going to launch. And I am then want you to respond to two of your classmates reflections or one of my responses to your classmates or your um, posting. So hopefully that we, way we can get some really interesting dialogue, ask some really interesting questions about our reading and dive deeper into our philosophical assumptions and interpretive this worldview, which wire up our methods that we're going to be learning throughout that semester. So please email me if you have any questions and thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye.